Kings of old and politicians of today have all kinds of great ideas and one or two not so great ideas. But you can always tell the ideas that they really care about because they choose to stay involved or to lead the project themselves. And for King David, uh, one of the things that was clearly close to his heart was worship and the worship movement, the original David's tent that we began to look at in our previous film because he put a lot of himself into it. We can see that in all the Psalms that he wrote and the commitment and love of worship on a personal level that that shows us. We can also see it structurally. We read in 1 Chronicles 25 verse 6, for instance, that although he appointed Jejuthun and Asaph and Heman as, as the leaders of this worship movement, they remained under the supervision of the king. What was it that made this so special to David? And what was it that then in turn meant that this was one of the greatest flourishings of music and worship that there's ever been, rippling down the centuries to today? And I want to suggest that it was the focus, David's focus in worship that was at the heart of it all. And what was that focus? God. God and the presence of God. I sometimes think as I read the Psalms and the stories of his life that David was obsessed with the presence of God. You see it in that famous story that I referenced in the last film, when David brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, in many ways the high point of his life and kingship, when the presence of God, the sign of his presence, is once more at the heart of the nation's life. And David dances and worships with all his might before the Lord. And he's told off by his wife, Michael, the daughter of Saul. He tells him that he's disgraced himself. He, he looks like a fool, but he doesn't mind. He is just focused on worshipping God. We also see it in uh, many of the Psalms that he wrote. Uh, I love Psalm 27, verse 4. It's one of David's Psalms. And we read this. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. What an extraordinary thing for a king to say, with all the, the political responsibilities he had, with all the governmental and military responsibilities he had. All things that actually he was very successful in. Uh, this is the, the golden age of Israel's prosperity, peace, security, justice and righteousness. And yet, and yet all of it seems to be peripheral to David, or maybe not peripheral, but, but the fruit of what is at the heart of it all. One thing only do I seek, that I may get, dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He wants to be in God's presence. That is his passion. That is his first concern. And everything else comes out of that. I know that's something that resonates with me. And I long to be a man like my namesake, David, who one only thing do I seek, to, to be in God's presence all the days of my life. And I often wonder whether that might have been the reason why God chose David in the first place. He describes him as a man after God's own heart in 1 Samuel 13. And that's uh, probably about David's character in many ways. But I wonder whether this almost literal longing after God's own heart, that he wants what, what's on God's heart, that he wants to come into God's presence, that he wants to be led and guided by him, is perhaps the reason why this man is chosen as Israel's great king. After all, David makes loads of mistakes. In many ways, he's a very flawed character, most dramatically in the moment when he commits adultery with Bathsheba and then abuses his power to, to cover it up and, and her husband is killed. And yet God forgives him. I sometimes compare his life to Saul's. In many ways, his mistakes are, are no worse, even uh, his mistakes are, are no better, even worse than Saul's. And yet God forgives David, continues to love him. And I wonder whether that was because Saul, for all his strengths, always seemed to be focused on Saul. 
He wasn't interested in God. As we saw in the last film, he forgot about the Ark of the Covenant. It was just left to one side. But David was always passionate about God and being in his presence. That's certainly what he taught when it came to uh, passing on his priorities and his worship to other people. We read in 1 Chronicles 16 of the instructions that he gives to the other worshippers for how they're to go about this great project. 1 Chronicles 16 verse 7, that day David first appointed Asaph and his associates to give praise to the Lord in this manner. And you wonder, okay, well, what was the what was the great masterclass on worship at this point? Did he talk about musical technique? Did he uh, talk about how the worship team was to be subdivided? Did he talk about practicalities or no, none of that? He sang them a song. I love that. I wonder whether there's something in that about how worship is not just taught but also caught. But it's a song that focuses them on God and on the presence. Of God. Let me read you the opening verses. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known amongst the nations what he has done, sing to him, praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength, seek his face also, always. And there's a total focus. He, he lifts their gaze to God and then he encourages them to, to exult and rejoice in God's presence as they seek him. So they're told to give praise to the Lord. It's focused on him. They're told to proclaim and glory in his name and then rejoice as they seek God and to seek his face always. It's David's own heart, but now passed on to, to the rest of the worshipping community of Israel. And friends, I think this is so important because I think we can often be souls. I think we can often start with the call of God, but then focus on, on trying to do everything that we can in our own strength to fulfil it, when actually we're called to be David's. Now, the irony is that when we're called to be David's, so many other things follow. David is the great king of prosperity, of peace, of justice, of, of everything that you want to happen. But it begins with the presence of God. And always in scripture, and I think always in life, God is looking for people who are after his own heart. People who can say with David, one thing alone do I seek. And in many ways, I think that's why worship is so important, because worship is all about doing that. It's about fulfilling the first commandment, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. It's about making everything about God and about seeking his presence and then allowing him to lead and guide us. That's what I long for my life. That's what I long for for your lives, that we would be marked by that same passion. As I finish, I want to uh, read a quote from Pete Gregg, the founder of the 24-7 prayer movement, one of the great church leaders of our time today. And uh, he talks about this same passion being at the heart of, of everyone who God uses. The pursuit of the presence of God has been without exception or exaggeration, the prevailing passion and the common purpose of all the saints in every generation since the time of Christ. So why don't we seek the presence of God now? Just spend some time in the silence or maybe listening to some music, just glorying in his name, seeking his face and rejoicing in his presence. Come Holy Spirit, we pray. Fill each of us as we watch this now. Come Holy Spirit, may we know your presence and would you light that fire of passion for you in our hearts. Come Holy Spirit.